All right, we're back. This is Intersection, a program of KBIA and the Reynolds Journalism Institute. I'm Ryan Fumioner, and today, amidst the ongoing controversy surrounding the United States Veterans Health Administration, we're talking about the issues facing the health care system and about the impact of the VA facilities here in Missouri. Joining me in studio today are Stephen Gaither, the Public Affairs Officer for the Truman VA Hospital in Columbia, Doug Meyer with the Missouri Veterans Commission, and joining us by Skype from Maryland is Stuart Hickey. He's the National Executive Director of AMVETS, a volunteer-led veteran service organization. And for you and our audience, have you had, you or a family member, use the VA system? What was the experience like for you? Share your thoughts. Give us a call at 573-882-8925 or email intersection at kbia.org. You could also tweet us at Intersect KBIA or join our online chat. And so, Stuart, sorry I had to interrupt you as we went to the break there. Um, But, yeah, I'd like to to hear a little bit more of your thoughts, again, on uh, on the reporting that's been done so far. And, again, the the situation we're in and and how we got here. Right. No problem. Uh, Right. Uh, You know, of course, you want to sell newspapers, you sensationalize uh, the trivial and and make it a big story. But this has become, from an initial story in Phoenix, it's become a, you know, a national story so much that we've actually gotten the Congress of the United States to do something. (laughs) That should be, you know, newsworthy right there. The House and the Senate both passed bills uh, for the Veterans Administration. Now, when was the last time you heard of the House and the Senate going together and passing a bill? So that tells you the magnitude of this. Uh, but, you know, yes, there are, I think, 42-some hospitals that they've, they've found problems with. They've sent the IG out, uh, you know, and like was said, out of 17 points of care. So, you know, it, it's a small number when you look at, There's 23 million American veterans in the country. About 6.5 million of those go to VA hospitals, get VA care. They have like 84 million appointments. So, uh, you know, it's a huge system. It's the largest healthcare system in the country. So, yeah, you're going to have problems. And if you go out to the civilian community, like I said, I worked in healthcare before I came to AMVETS. Civilian hospitals, you don't hear about this because they pay, uh, you know, awards to the family members of the people they kill, and you and there's a confidentiality agreement, and you don't hear about it. So that's why it's not in the news. The VA is a public government-run system, and, you know, they're open and transparent. People can get the information about what happens there. So, uh, of course, you know, they're pulling up the curtains and letting everybody look in. Uh, so it's going to look a lot worse than probably what it actually is. Now, if you've got one veteran that dies, you know, that's too many. But Yeah, that's that's exactly, you both said that at the same time. Uh, Stephen here in the room said that as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, it, to your equation earlier of, you know, cured or dead, unfortunately they were on the wrong side of that equation, right? Um, one thing that also happened, we'd mentioned before, of course, is that Eric Shinseki resigned as well as, as a result of a lot of this reporting. Um, what, what, is that a good thing? Was that the right move? Or I wonder your reactions to that, um, since that was one of the, the large things that came out of this so far anyway. Well, I'd, I'd leave it up to Stuart as a representative of veteran ser- service organizations. I think uh, the vast majority thought it wasn't the right move. Um, and there are many folks that agree with that. But, but as a VA person, I, I really can't share my personal opinion. Sure. Uh, I think Secretary Shinseki did a, a pretty remarkable job. And in the focus that he did put on homelessness in the veteran population and trying to address the backlog with uh, the, the uh, benefits claims and, and uh, hiring veterans into the Department of those are all uh, achievements that he should be acknowledged for. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I, I, would, I would agree. Uh, we were we were one of the uh, veteran service organizations that did not call for the secretary to resign because we didn't believe that, you know, just cutting off the head was going to solve the problems. Uh, and we felt that he had made reforms in the VA and was working towards that. The only problem that that we had was the reluctance of the secretary to hold people under him accountable. Uh, 
you know, when there, when you had things like Phoenix and other situations throughout the VA, in any other universe, that person would have been fired. Somehow, people aren't held accountable, and, and we believe that and if you're going to change the culture, which is a big thing that we spoke to all the VISN directors about, that VA needs to change its culture or it's going to go, what's going to happen is it'll go away. It'll become privatized and VHA will cease to exist. Uh, so we did not call for the secretary to resign. We supported him up until the last second that, you know, uh, and I really don't believe that he resigned. I believe he went to the White House and was told, you know, you have to go. Well, to your point of, the, of possible privatization, I mean, there was a smaller scale, but there was a proposal uh, from the Senate that passed that would have allowed that would allow veterans to go to a doctor of their choosing if they live too far away from a VA hospital. For that matter. Yeah. yeah. Or if they had to wait too long. And, you know, that's a tool that's been available already. Okay. Uh, it's just expanded with that law, it, it focused that. But VA has had the authority to do non-VA care, to purchase care from private sector mm -hmm. uh, providers if there's an access issue, if, it's, if they don't have the capacity to do that. Uh, for example, last year in Columbia, we spent $21 million in non-VA care mm -hmm. because of, of access <coughs> issues. Starting in February, we saw some problems with two particular areas, uh, optometry and podiatry, and we started to do a lot of non-VA care because we didn't have the internal capacity to address that demand. Uh, so a lot more will be spent. The, the piece that you want to make sure you don't lose is the continuity of care. And the principle of primary care is that your primary care provider in concert with the veteran is managing that veteran's health care. If you are just going to contract out just be an insurance company, you're going to lose that continuity of care. And that, yeah, we have a comment from Bethany in the chat room that's on this same, same vein. Uh, you know, paying a, pe a competitive market price for health care is a must to receive adequate care for our vets. Paying a differential in smaller or rural markets, meaning the provider would see, receive more compensation than someone working out of Columbia, would ensure that the country's obligation is taken care, for, taken care of, she says. And the issue, though, the real issue is, are there providers in the rural area? And mm. if you look at and our not, service area, VA issue, that's a if you look at our service area, the 45 counties that we serve, only one of those counties is not a medically underserved county. So finding the providers to, to provide that service is not going to be as easy as people make it out to be. One of the recommendations sure. that we had was to have the VA, uh, maybe on a short-term basis, sunset it for two years, uh, use the FQHCs as a primary uh, care physician, which is a federally qualified health center, which are located throughout the country in underserved areas. Uh, just to sort of, that would add, there's probably, I don't know, 1,200 of them throughout the United States. That would at least augment the VA's primary care physicians to help them get the, you know, if there was a waiting list. And, and he's right. Globally, there's a shortage of physicians. Uh, so, you know, especially rural areas. I live in Appalachian, Pennsylvania. It's, you know, a hard place to find. People don't want to come there. They want to go two hours away to Pittsburgh and work, uh, you know, the city that, that has a lot of things. So uh, it's hard to recruit physicians. And then if you can get the physician to come, you probably aren't going to get his wife to want to come. So, you know, that's who you have to recruit, the wife. <laughs> but but he's right. The uh, you know the VA and, and partially it's part of the system we'd like to see reformed in the VA is their personnel system. It takes an inordinate amount of time to hire someone in the VA. If you're a doctor graduating from medical school and you've got several hundred thousand dollars in VA or not VA loans but student loans, which they have a, a loan forgiveness program that they help to recruit, but if you do, you're not going to come in and say, oh, yeah, I'll come work for you, VA. And then six months later, you start to work. You're going to go where you can get hired, you know, today. And that's part of the problem with recruiting with 
professionals, you know, doctors, nurses, psychiatrists, specialists, and the VA is, it takes forever to get them on board. And, and that just isn't a VA issue. That's an Office of Personnel Management issue. That's any federal job. So right. uh, we can talk about reforming hiring mm -hmm. practices with the VA, but it's government-wide. So. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, to get back to, you threw out the numbers earlier, Stuart, and we talked about them briefly during the break, the 21, 22 million veterans in the U.S. and, and the six and a half that actually get care. That at, was last yeah. fiscal year. Mm -hmm. There's actually about 9 million that are enrolled in the VA health care system. For whatever reason, 2.5 million chose not to get care in fiscal year 2013. Um, but th that's part of the – we were talking about the eligibility. That's, that's a confusing part for the people and for veterans to understand. And, and you know, you have to kind of wind your way through the bureaucracy. But, but uh, Doug talked about it. The, the system was started – First and foremost, to take care of veterans who had service-related injury or illness. Over time, other veterans in special categories achieved a status just below that priority group of service-connected. Mm -hmm. World War I veterans and former prisoners of war, and veterans exposed to ionizing radiation from the late 40s and early 50s, and veterans who were exposed to Asian Orange in Vietnam, and veterans who have health problems because of service in the Persian Gulf. It assumed that those veterans didn't have service-connected disability, but they were in the next tier of priority. Then the vast majority of folks that have served in the military and has, have a discharge other than dishonorable are, don't meet any of those categories. So they are categorized as non-service-connected veterans. To be eligible as a non-service-connected veteran, there's an income requirement. The means test is an income and assets uh, that veterans have to report when they apply for VA health care. Mm -hmm. And if they exceed that threshold, which is right around $30,000 a year now for a non-service connected veteran without any, per without any dependents, they're not going to be eligible. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do we know how many veterans are eligible but are not taking advantage of that eligibility? There are some estimates based on Medicaid eligibility mm -hmm. that veterans who are eligible for Medicaid uh, may be in that group that would be eligible based on their income. Okay. Ryan, what concerns me, as I uh, mentioned, uh, are three key messages from the Missouri Veterans Commission. One was to see a veteran service officer. Our second one is to sign up for VA health care. And uh, I, we, we, we all know that there are many eligible veterans out there who have not signed up for VA health care. A lot of them hear about the uh, negative stories. We don't hear enough about the good. And my concern is that we are missing out, many veterans are missing out on good VA health care because they hear the negative stories. They say, well, I don't want to be with involved that. Yeah, with sure. that indeed. So I'm not going to sign up. Where if they did, they might be getting the health care that they need because there's many good programs going on today in the VA that don't get mentioned, that, that need to be mentioned, that... People need these services. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we talked about the, the disabilities that, uh, that people have from service. Uh, it is the job of the VA to take care of those uh, disabilities and provide that health care to our veterans. Mm -hmm. So we still encourage veterans, sign up for VA health care. Uh, our, our third key message is just to uh, join a veteran service organization. Get the information you need from the folks at the uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars, the Disabled American Veterans, and the uh, American Legion, and so on. Very important to get that information because people who are affiliated with other veterans are better informed veterans, more knowledgeable of their benefits, and the, the help is there if they ask. But asking for it is to find an advocate, you're dealing with the government, get help. Mm -hmm. Now, we, if we rely upon the news as our marketing tool to attract patients, we're never going to get new patients because mm -hmm. the definition of news is people who don't do their job right. Mm -hmm. If you're doing your job right, that isn't news. <laughs> but the, the best part of marketing for our facility over time, and we've, we've been one of those unique facilities that has a steady increase in new patients every year for the last 20 years. The best marketing tool we have is the word of satisfied patients who talk to their peers and say, it's great care at Truman VA, you ought to sign up. 
Yeah, you know, Stephen, that's exactly yeah. right. Because I get so many people who walk into the office saying, uh, my neighbor uh, has been treated at uh, the uh, Veterans Hospital in St. Louis. How do I get affiliated? Uh, what do I have to do? Yeah, and, and we'll help with uh, filling out the forms that they need to apply for their health care as well as their benefits. Mm -hmm. I need to take a moment to remind our audience this is Intersection, a program of KBIA and the Reynolds Journalism Institute. I'm Ryan Fumulner, and today, amidst the ongoing controversy surrounding the United States Veterans Health Administration, we're talking about the issues facing the health care system and about the impact at the VA facilities here in Missouri. Joining us in studio today are Stephen Gaither, the Public Affairs Officer for the Truman VA Hospital in Columbia, Doug Meyer of the Missouri Veterans Commission, and joining us by Skype from Maryland is Stuart Hickey. He's the National Executive Director of AMVETS, a volunteer-led veteran service organization. And for you and our audience, what questions do you have about the Veterans Health Administration? You can ask one of our panelists by giving us a call at 573-882-8925 or email intersection at kbia.org. You could also tweet us at intersect kbia. And so, yeah, we're talking about all the, uh, you know, opportunities to attract new patients. But again, one of the existing problems is that we have a lot of people enrolled. I mean, we may, do we have too many people enrolled already for, for the, what the system can handle? I mean, I know you, uh, Stephen, you can maybe only talk about what's happening here in Columbia. But. Well, I don't think anyone in Congress would say that. They would say that they've given resources to the VA healthcare system and that there's capacity to, to treat that patient population. Um, and it's a fine line for each facility, whether or not they can handle additional uh, patients at this time. So they'll have to, to weigh that decision. Um, we believe that we can handle a slow, steady increase, but we don't want to get a big push or we will be uh, in trouble. Mm -hmm. Part of the other thing that's been missing in this whole story, this scandal, is the VA healthcare system isn't just health care. Okay, that delivering quality patient care to veterans is our number one mission. But there are two other important missions, and that is health care, uh, education of health care professionals and research. And, you know, the, the VA health care system affiliates with 107 U.S. medical schools. Half of all the medical students in this country rotate through VA health care, and anywhere from a third to a to a half of physician residents will rotate through VA healthcare facilities. There are 1,200 other educational affiliations for nursing students, social work students, physical therapy, allied health training, even hospital administrator trainees mm -hmm. come through the VA healthcare system. 90,000 students are trained every single year in the VA healthcare system. And in research, VA funded research has been instrumental in significant breakthroughs in, in our history treatment in cancer, treatment in tuberculosis, new prosthetic appliances, uh, diagnostic tools like the CAT scan, breakthroughs with mental health. Post-traumatic stress disorder did not exist in our language until a VA-funded researcher wrote a journal article in the early 1980s, and it was added to the DSM manual. Mm -hmm. So all the signs and symptoms have been around forever, but the term didn't exist until that VA-funded research investigator wrote his journal article. Mm -hmm. So those are all key parts, and it, it's missing when you're just being criticized for wait lists. Sure. Stephen, I hear so, so many good things about the uh, Columbia VA Medical Center. And I think part of that has to do with its affiliation with the uh, University of Missouri Hospital. Uh, the two facilities are connected. Absolutely. We've been affiliated with the, the University of Missouri School of Medicine since the day we opened in 1972. And we have many of our attending physician staff who have academic appointments or who practice on both sides of the street. The resident physicians will be part of the, the mix. Um, and, and it does add to the, the ability to deliver that high quality patient care. The other thing that Columbia has had, and, and, it, and it's just fortuitous, and that is our frontline staff have a work ethic that allows them to buy into good customer service. And if you see the feedback that we get from the veterans, for the most part, our veterans are very satisfied with the care that they get. Just a month ago, uh, U.S. Senator Claire McCaskill talked about her survey of veterans program that she has on her website. And she asked veterans to voluntarily share their experiences at VA medical centers in St. Louis, Kansas City, and Columbia. And Columbia scored... Uh, higher than the other two facilities, and the veterans spoke very uh, positively about their experience. Ninety percent of the surveyed veterans said they would recommend Truman VA to another veteran. Yeah, and I wonder, uh, 
your input on that, Stuart, too. I mean, we mentioned a little bit about the layout in Columbia, the partnership they have with the university here. What, what are some of the formulas that do make for successful VA facilities around the, around the country, and, and what are ones that maybe don't, I suppose? I, I think that is a, a, a good recipe for success is when you're near an academic facility uh, or organization and you have a, an agreement with them to work together on things. Uh, just anecdotally, around the country, places in those situations seem to do better than others. I don't, you know, the VA tells us uh, up at the secretary level that there's no correlation, but it's hard for me to believe that when I see, you know, I hear examples like that and, and other places. Uh, I've heard other VSO executive directors saying the same thing about other areas in the country. You just can't help but think that there's some correlation there with an academic community. Uh, but what about? But on the of course, there was a troubling bit of news today coming out about uh, patient safety, and this is nationwide healthcare. But one in eight patients in our healthcare system in the United States is pos- is going to have a hospital acquired problem. Could mm-hmm. be an infection, could be an injury, whatever. And they were talking about the academic affiliated. Uh, medical centers as being areas that have the highest rate of those kinds of uh, episodes. So, mm-hmm. you know, we believe it makes a big difference, but sometimes the, the data don't always support what sure. we believe. Sure. And well, there, of course, are all kinds of challenges in general for running sort of medical facility. Um, but that we have a question, a comment from Shirley that kind of fits into that. I mean, she says the VA just needs to accept the criticism here and move on and use this experience as an opportunity to improve. What kind of, what kind of opportunities the are there to improve that could come out well, of this obviously, for the system as a whole? Obviously, for- we are focusing on that scheduling package and there's a new scheduling program that will be replace it. Uh, it it's cumbersome it's difficult and the secretary has already said there'll be a new scheduling package it gives us an opportunity once again to focus what our mission is and our mission is to deliver high quality care to veterans and to make them believe that we are the system of their choice that they will come back to us uh, for their health care needs. Mm-hmm. Stuart, Stuart said it earlier, Congress is actually acting on something. I mean, is there a chance to look, I mean, go beyond your waiting list problem here and reach out to other areas of, think, of needs for the The VA? proof will be yeah. in the pudding if yeah. the bill is actually agreed to and the president signs it. So that's all sure. conjecture on what sure. happens if. Yeah. yeah well, I get, Stuart? Just a point I'd like to make. Uh, you know, the, the third leading cause of death in the United States is for medical uh, going to a hospital. Mm-hmm. So, and that's nationwide. So, uh, you know, these, these stories of, of veterans dying for whatever reason. And like I said before, you know, we don't want one to die unnecessarily. Uh, but it, it's, it's not uncommon. I mean, you know, when the third leading cause of death, probably over a hundred thousand people die just from because they went to a hospital in the United States. Uh, that's a lot of people. Every year. Right, right. right. Um, Every year. Yeah. Just to bring up, we have a few minutes left in the show, bring up the news of the day. We buried it to the end of the show. But Claire McCaskill did release a statement today about how the VA handled whistleblowers, um, some criticism about that, uh, who had highlighted problems over recent years, um, that they basically had faced possible repercussions, that kind of thing. I mean, is there an openness and encouragement within VA systems? I know, uh, Stephen, you can only talk about Columbia, but uh, w- as far as you can see, to, to encourage this type of constructive feedback. Well, that's, uh, cer- feedback. that's certainly yeah. what we believe, but yeah. the Office of General Counsel sent a letter to the president today mm-hmm. uh, highlighting episodes where obviously that didn't happen. So, right. again, another, another uh, area that needs attention and people need to take corrective action. Yeah. Uh, there are folks that, uh, that believe we have a very transparent situation. There are folks that don't. It, it depends on where you are. And, and your perception on that. Um, yeah, I wonder your take I, on that too, Stuart. Uh, to me, it's leadership and management. If they, at, at their hospital, and it sounds to me, and from everything I've heard from our AMVETS people, Missouri is a, a, you know, a well-managed uh, VA system out there. Uh, but what we've seen is it, it depends on who the hospital administrator is or the hospital director or the vision director, if they encourage a culture of, you know, if you have problems, come to me and we'll find a solution, 
then you probably have a well-managed uh, organization. If it's, I don't want to hear your problems, you know, that's when things uh, become a problem. And if somebody's a whistleblower, then they're punished and, you know, it just snowballs. And it doesn't create a very good work environment for the employees. And, you know, there's 341,000 VA employees throughout the country. Hundreds of thousands of those people do a great job for veterans every day. All we're hearing are the small minority of people who don't. Right. Unfortunately, that's what gets in the news. Well, and it's not difficult to find someone who's unhappy. And if, if you're working in the news media, uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of work to find someone who wants to tell them <laughs> about why they're unhappy times. about something. Yeah. But, but, but uh, Stephen, when you find somebody who's uh, unhappy, what I do is tell them right away there is a patient advocate at each VA medical center that you can contact, and they will handle your complaint. So uh, we always have the patient advocate numbers close by so that we can refer veterans to them, and more likely they're going to be satisfied with the help of the patient advocate. And, and when you have a commitment from your frontline staff to also address problems at the lowest level, that also. But, but that doesn't always satisfy someone who's unhappy. With, with just a couple minutes left, just the parting thoughts from all of you, if, if you'd like, just quickly weigh in on what you would like to see happen now. What, what can help you best serve your mission as we deal with the ramifications of all this reporting that has happened since that's not going away for a little while? Anymore? Well, we want to emphasize our positive numbers. <laughs> we, want to, we want to emphasize the fact that if a veteran comes to us today, we have appointments available within the next five days for their primary care appointment. Uh, we average, the latest figure is 18 days between when they come to us and their first appointment for primary care, 11 days for mental health, 33 days for specialty care, and 26 for all mm -hmm. new patients. And so your hopeful outcome there is that people will just continue to seek their service, seek your services. That's right. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, I wonder, uh, Doug, yeah, what, what, what do you want to happen now? <laughs> One of our key messages is to sign up for VA health care. We're not going to change that key message uh, one iota. We still will encourage veterans to sign up and get services and the health care that they need and um, if there's a problem, be a positive voice for change. Stuart, finally, your thoughts? Uh, well, we'd like to see the, uh, you know, the Veterans Omnibus Bill passed and signed by the president, which hopefully you know, is going to give the VA the resources they need to, to, to provide services to these veterans. Okay. Well, with that, that's all the time that we have for today's intersection. Thanks very much to our guests Stephen Gaither is the public affairs officer at the Truman VA Hospital in Columbia. Doug Meyer is the director of the Veteran Service Program with the Missouri Veterans Commission. And Stuart Hickey joined us by Skype from Maryland. He's the national executive director of AMVETS, a volunteer-led veteran service organization. We'd like to remind you, those of you enjoying this rebroadcast, the intersection takes place live for a full hour from 2 to 3 every Monday afternoon. You can watch live streaming video of our program each Monday afternoon online at kbia.org. Alongside that video, you can submit your questions and comments and take part in an online discussion with others in the audience. You'll also find an archive of all of our past programs, including the full hour of today's conversation. Intersections are broadcast from the Reynolds Journalism Institute and is a project of RJI and KBIA. Intersections produced by Janet Saidi and Maureen Lewis Stump. Travis McMillan is our technical director with production, production assistance from Lowell Thomas. Uh, Kyle Felling is our audio producer today. Executive directors are Mike Dunn and Mike McKean. And I'm Ryan from Mueller. Thanks for joining us today and have a great week.